Starship Flight 9 is poised to shatter aerospace limits this May, but after past explosions, can SpaceX and the FAA ensure safety? Uncover the stakes with us. As the launch date for Flight 9 draws near, it's also time for us to take a closer look at the regulations and warning notices surrounding the mission to truly understand the specific flight path of Starship and the immense scale of this launch, especially after the upper stages of the vehicle exploded during Flight 7 and 8 earlier this year. These incidents caused flaming debris to fall like a rain of steel over populated areas, including the Turks and Caicos Islands, the Bahamas and parts of Florida, resulting in flight diversions and delays at major airports such as Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Orlando. Although the debris did fall within the designated area, it still poses a potential danger to the public if more severe failures occur during the next launch. And perhaps anticipating the possibility of another issue with Starship's second stage, the FAA and SpaceX are proactively implementing measures to reduce risks to aviation and public safety in the Caribbean region. This is evidenced by the newly published NOTAM warning for Flight 9. Unlike previous flights, the NOTAM, effective from May 13, 2025, includes a completely new area north of Cuba, which had not been part of the identified hazard zones for past Starship launches. This zone lies along the typical flight corridor for Starship, beginning from SpaceX's Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas, heading eastward across the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, before targeting a splashdown in the Indian Ocean. This truly reflects the FAA and SpaceX's uncertainty about the stability of Starship Flight 9, even though Ship 35 has already successfully completed its third static fire test with newly installed engines. Clearly, no one wants a failure to occur, but everyone understands that failure is not an option, which is why, at all costs, SpaceX and the FAA will prioritize human safety above all else. Currently, the FAA is working closely with SPACEX to assess risks and ensure public safety. A launch license is expected to be issued soon, clearing Starship for liftoff with the earliest potential launch window opening on May 21st, between 6.30 p.m. and 8.34 p.m. Central Time, marking SpaceX Starship's first-ever night launch. This update follows the most recent hazard warning released by the U.S. Coast Guard, in terms of Starship's readiness, the vehicle appears to be on track to meet that timeline. There's little debate over Booster 14. It's ready to move out to the launch pad to undergo final pre-launch tests, likely including one more static fire test followed by a wet dress rehearsal. Keep in mind that this booster will be reused for the first time, so it's expected that it will go through more testing than usual. As for Starship's second stage, Ship 35 has just completed its third static fire test, achieving a record 60-second burn. Moreover, unlike previous static fires where all engines typically shut down at once, the RVAC engines on S35, optimized for vacuum operation, shut down in sequential stages rather than all at the same time. By gradually reducing thrust, SpaceX aims to minimize vibrations that could cause leaks or structural damage. Additionally, Flight 9 will include an in-space engine reignition test, where S-35 will attempt to restart one or more RVAC engines to simulate orbital maneuvers or deorbit burns. The stage shutdown may be part of refining these procedures. All of this is in pursuit of a more successful Starship launch in the upcoming flight. The success of this mission will bring SpaceX one step closer to its ultimate goal, achieving orbital capability with Starship. If the company can demonstrate that Starship can reach orbit, even though it has not yet shown it can land precisely back at Starbase, its next goal will be validating the technologies needed for the Moonlander variant of Starship and deploying larger versions of its Starlink satellites. These tasks will keep Starship busy for the next few years. However, if SpaceX succeeds in meeting its ambitious targets for cost, performance, and launch cadence, the launch market will see an unprecedented increase in capacity by the end of this decade. Some companies and individuals are already planning how to take advantage of this capability to pursue missions that are currently either unfeasible or unaffordable. Still, skeptics remain unconvinced that Starship will dominate the entire launch market. Many have been thinking for years about how to use Starship. Developers of commercial space stations, for example, see it as an efficient way to launch large modules 
One such company, Starlab Space, envisions sending its entire space station into orbit aboard a single starship. Meanwhile, NASA is exploring ways to leverage Starship for the upcoming Habitable Worlds Observatory Space Telescope. As Starship moves closer to becoming operational, more and more people are exploring its potential. Starship can carry around 150,000 kilograms. That's substantial, said Michael Palusek, president of Princeton Satellite Systems, during a presentation at the annual conference in Boston. So, what do we do with it? He outlined various possibilities, such as enabling space-based manufacturing of pharmaceuticals and semiconductors. There may well be industries that work best in low Earth orbit, but how do we get the necessary equipment and raw materials up there, and how do we bring the products back? Starship's enormous payload bay could make that possible. Other proposals are more speculative, such as mining helium-3 from the moon or gas giants for use in future fusion reactors. Starship could also support massive robotic missions that would otherwise require multiple launches. Palusek recalled a NASA concept from two decades ago, the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter. That nuclear-powered spacecraft would have needed three separate launches. What happens if launch number two fails, he asked. Another AAS speaker, Yoslav Vakubivsky, a postdoc at MIT, discussed his team's Venus mission concepts. Their first mission, a small atmospheric probe to search for biosignatures, is scheduled to launch next year on a rocket lab vehicle. But they have plans for larger missions. A second mission in the early 2030s would deploy a balloon about 5 meters wide and 3 meters tall into Venus's atmosphere for further study. The third and most ambitious mission would send a 27-meter-wide balloon capable of collecting atmospheric samples and returning them to Earth via a two-ton rocket launched from Venus's atmosphere. A Venus sample return mission, this concept was studied under NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts in NIACI program in 2023. One of the main challenges, according to Bivsky, is inflating such a large balloon and suspending a heavy rocket beneath it for launch. Only a rocket as large as Starship could make this feasible. We conducted multiple trade studies and Starship emerged as the best solution, he said. Other rockets required multiple launches, increasing the risk and complexity beyond justification. Ultimately, Elon Musk envisions using Starship to establish a permanent human presence on Mars. While he has often talked about sending people there soon, he's offered few details about what they would actually do once they arrive or how they would live, aside from a few concept images released by SpaceX. Others are working to fill in those gaps. George Lordos, a research scientist in MIT's Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, noted that Starship's capabilities would allow for much larger expeditions than NASA's typical Mars mission concepts, which often involve only four astronauts. With crews that small, each person must wear many hats, he said at the AAS session. At what point does that become not just inefficient, but a safety risk? He advocates for larger crews that, while more expensive, would enable far more science, similar to how research is done in Antarctica. But that requires not only transport to and from Mars, but long-term support systems once there. MIT researchers have designed a Mars-based concept called Pale Red Dot, a long acronym that won a NASA student competition in 2023. It involves modular habitats that can be linked together to form two villages, housing a total of 36 people. In this concept, Starship would deliver two habitat modules per launch. A system dubbed the Star Crane would lower the modules onto mobile platforms, skateboards, which would transport them into position. Each module would feature a rigid base in an inflatable upper section to maximize interior volume. The idea is to build large villages, maybe 30 modules per village, Lordo said. Each crew member would have their own small studio apartment. Specialized modules would serve different purposes, such as one with a swimming pool in the upper section and a storm shelter beneath it. The water would act as a radiation shield, and that section just happens to be the 10 forward bar, he joked. It's a vision of a Mars base that is rich in energy, water, food and crew time, he said, will no longer be limited by how much mass we can send. Starship's massive payload capacity, low cost per kilogram, and high flight cadence could give it a significant edge in the launch market, especially for missions that have flexibility in vehicle choice. 
But not all launch needs are the same. SpaceX's rise, particularly through rideshare missions on Falcon 9, has already disrupted the market for small launch vehicles by drawing away customers. A Starship rideshare, possibly with the help of orbital transfer vehicles, could further squeeze small rocket companies. Despite those concerns, companies at the recent SmallSat Symposium in Silicon Valley were more optimistic. We've seen super heavy launch vehicles arrive, which is great, but they don't solve every problem, said Peter Beck, CEO of Rocket Lab. He emphasized that small launchers still have a place. Different missions have different requirements, he said, likening Starship to an Airbus A380 and Rocket Lab's Electron to a private jet. Executives from other small launcher firms echoed that view. Vehicle size matters for rapid response, said Stella Gillian, chief commercial officer of Ezar Aerospace. Our class of rockets is well-suited for fast production and quick turnaround. Marino Fragnito of Avio, which produces the Vega C rocket, said, we can serve about 99% of satellites in low Earth orbit. Why build a bigger, more expensive rocket if we won't gain more market share? Tan Vandenraz, CEO of asteroid mining startup Carmen Plus, is also skeptical of Starship's long-term influence. His company plans to extract water from asteroids to use as spacecraft fuel. People talk about cheap launch, but it doesn't really exist, he said, noting that SpaceX has increased Falcon 9 launch prices and might do the same with Starship. He argued that Starship's need for orbital refueling, even for GEO missions, puts Carmen Plus at a cost advantage. We have an order of magnitude benefit because of our refueling architecture for GEO. Starship just can't compete. One lingering concern is the risk of designing systems that rely exclusively on Starship. What happens if the rocket is delayed or canceled? George Lordos isn't worried. We're entering a new era where mass is no longer a constraint, he said. Even if Starship fails, its development has already sparked competition. In the pale red dot concept, the habitats could be adapted to fly on other super heavy launch vehicles. It's not ideal, but it would still work. As he summed it up during his talk, go big or stay home. That's all for today's update. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.